Layla! Scott, <laughs> we've been doing this for 15, 15, 15 years. And you, in fact, spoken at Chautauqua at the, on the amphitheater. Uh, you're a rock star in so many instances. But were you destined to be a lawyer? I was not. My dad wanted me to be a doctor. Really? Yes. Was and he a doctor? No, but his father was a doctor and my uncle's a doctor. And if you come from the Middle East, the only appropriate professions, honestly, are doctor and maybe engineer. <laughs> so those were kind of my choices. And yeah. so was there an aha moment in your life where you went from going to Douglas College, which was part of Rutgers, and then working its way through the collegiate process? You know, I was, um, I ran for student government only because I'd kind of been interested in politics a little bit in high school. I didn't have a clear view, but I did run for the Douglas student government and then I ran for the Rutgers University Senate. And it was my first kind of big feminist aha moment mm -hmm. because the only, Douglas was a woman's college, uh, and I think it's still a woman's residential college. Um, it's not formally co-ed, but it was actually a college for women uh, when I went there, and the only students elected to the University Senate who were women were from Douglas. And I thought, oh, and it's because there were like no guys to elect because we only had women at Douglas. So that was kind of my first awakening. And so I served on the Rutgers, Rutgers University Senate and I was assigned to the Finance Committee, which mm -hmm. I knew nothing about. And the World Council of Churches came in with a resolution to divest all of Rutgers holdings in stocks of companies doing business in South Africa. And so all of a sudden, I became very involved in that sort of anti-apartheid movement, learning about South Africa. Uh, the committee voted not to divest, and I wrote a dissent. So I became very famous on campus. I was like, I don't know, 17 years old, 18 years old. I had no idea, really, it would become such a big furor. Um, but that was sort of my introduction to, to politics. Then I went and did pre-med. Um, I finished my pre-med degree, got accepted to Rutter Rutgers Medical School, and didn't go. Shocking. And then I took the LSAT and went to law school. The Green Wave. Tulane. Tulane, yes. <laughs> Love uh, that's Tulane. That's quite a I mean, New Jersey to New Orleans. Oh, yeah. My, my family thought I fell into a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> I had a great experience. I loved Tulane. I, I really, I had great teachers. Um, I don't know that I would want to live in New Orleans and raise a family. It is quite culturally distinct. And th the racism was, was pretty bad, to be honest. You, you could just feel it everywhere, especially at the time that I went to law school. But that said, I had an amazing experience going to law school there. I had a great time, wonderful faculty, and they had a big international law program. And I had decided I was going to be an international lawyer. So I actually only looked, I looked at Tulane, Georgetown, and a couple of the Ivies, and that was it. Did you pick up French there? Um, I learned a little French at home, and then in high school, and then I studied in Grenoble, and then I kept studying my French, yeah. Because I could see that which your career took you Absolutely. to Absolutely. Paris, right? Absolutely. Then I went to the Sorbonne, after I did my graduate work at Columbia, I went to the Sorbonne, got my law degree from the Sorbonne, and practiced law, business law, actually in Paris for five years. You know, I found yeah. fascinating, and I've done several interviews the last couple of days, and um, from Anna, to Nazat, mm. Nazat, and now you are all kind of commercial law litigators. You yeah, know? isn't that funny? It really is. Yeah, funny. I was an international arbitration person. Yeah. I, I did a lot of work on big commercial arbitrations, did a lot of banking, uh, sovereign debt restructuring, big commercial practice. Um, which is, I actually tell that to my students now because I tell them, don't worry, you know, get a great job doing something you want to do. And those skills can be translated to any other field of law. So when I became interested in human rights and international criminal law, all those skills I had learned in commercial litigation, how to organize information, how to, in a sense, dissect a file, that was all completely transportable to my new field. But you get, you're practicing law, I mean, you're in, you're in the real world of the dark side of the practice of law, and all of a sudden, academia sneaks into your life. How's that happen? Oh, I'd, I'd wanted to be an academic since the end of my first year at Tulane. 
I, I just had, I, I've been very lucky, I think, Greg, to have these little epiphanies in my life. The, the problem is they don't come on command. They come <laughs> randomly. And I just remember I looked at my, my teachers coming out of the law school building, and I thought, oh, I want your job. Like, it was just like that. And, and they actually helped me prepare for an academic career. I did clerking. I wrote in the law review. I did all the things that you're supposed to do to prepare for an academic career, including in those days, it was considered very important to be in practice so that you had some real world skill. You'd acquired some real world skills to be able to prepare your students to take, take the bar, basically. Well, so what was your timing? You did, you clerked for a judge in the Fifth Circuit. And, uh, and, and wrote a variety of articles. Was, was that prior to you becoming a, in a private law practice, or did you do that afterwards? They were parallel. They were parallel. So I worked for firms uh, really pretty much every summer. I split my summers a lot of times. I worked for firms. I then worked actually for a New Orleans firm after my third year of law school while I took the bar. Then I went to work for Judge Tate. And then I thought I'd go into teaching. I had Supreme Court applications outstanding. Mm. And so I was hopeful because the other golden ticket to law professor jobs is the Supreme Court clerkship. Sure. And Tulane had had a relatively good track record. And I had a choice of taking a couple of different options. And I got two interviews, I didn't get the clerkship. But because I was thinking of going right into teaching, if I had gotten the Supreme Court clerkship, I had my name and my CV in the registry where they hire, you know, from which they hire law professors. And that's how um, Columbia Law School actually found me in that registry and offered me the opportunity to go to Columbia and then to go to Paris. Um, on a fellowship. And my, my mentors at Tulane said, you should do it. You're too young, you don't have the experience, like keep, keep doing more. Um, especially in those days, there were virtually no women on law faculties. And so having a little bit more skill and experience under your belt was considered very important. So you did that and, um, and law practice, and then how, does, how did you get into becoming Professor Leila Sanat? I, I was very fortunate, really. I, I was in Paris and I had decided to get married and come back to the United States and start law teaching. I put my resume into the AALS directory again. That's the American Association of Law Schools directory. And I got a whole slew of interviews which was very encouraging, obviously. And I flew back home, I did a bunch of interviews, and I decided to go to Washington University. I loved the dean then, and I saw them actually before the hiring conference. They made me an offer right away. And I had other schools bidding on me, but it was like kind of why she loved me first. So, I, uh, and St. Louis, you know, I'd already, I'd already lived in New Orleans. I wasn't afraid to go someplace new. I, I liked the city, and I really, really liked the faculty and the dean. So you then become part of the faculty of Washington University School of Law. Mm -hmm. And what year was that, roughly? 1992. Wow. I know. I know. I can't believe it. And as part of what was your principal teaching? What did you teach? Well, Probably so they thought I, I, they hired a corporate lawyer. So I had corporations, civil procedure, a course in international business drafting and planning. And I got to teach a seminar in the law of the European Union. I didn't know EU law. I really didn't practice that in Paris. That was not my specialty, and it's a highly specialized field, but they figured I'd been living in Paris. That was fine. And they also asked me to coach the Jessup competition, which was public international law. When I tried to explain that I didn't practice public international law, I still they were like, it's international, just do it. So that's how I really got interested in public international law. Yeah. Now, being in public international law is a, a broader base than just international criminal law. Yeah, that was another one of these weird epiphanies that came out of nowhere. I was really thinking about what I would write about for my first pre-tenure article, and I was re still reading all the French um, 
Oh, we used to call them advance sheets. I don't think anybody reads advance sheets anymore, but <laughs> right? I remember you remember. Yeah, yeah. And I, I see this article about this fellow named Paul Tuvier who is being prosecuted in France and gets acquitted um, by a French criminal court. And the furor that 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 caused, and the article was actually about crimes against humanity because he'd been accused of crimes against humanity for his execution of seven Jewish people mm -hmm. during World War II. And I was just fascinated by this article. And that, I, I still remember running down the hall to a couple of my colleagues and saying, can, can I write about this? And they said, yeah, that's great. And, and the rest is kind of history. So you write the article, it gets published mm -hmm. in, in Law Journal or in a... Columbia Journal? Journal of Transnational Law. Okay, so can you get, now get some press. You're out there, you you're, uh, become a player, and what's the next logical step? Well, so... I assume you didn't have an actual class in international criminal no, law. No, no, we didn't. It was before ICL really existed in U.S. law schools, but what happened is I... Um, as we did in those days before social media and blogs, is you took your article and you would send it to people who you had cited, for example, in the article for comment, because this is a core area now of my work. And so I sent it out to a, a few people, you might know some of their names, Sharif Basuni, sure. Edward Wise, uh, Chris Blakesley. Uh, Chris is still alive, Ed and Sharif have passed. And I sent it to Al Rubin, who actually was um, the president of the International Law Association. Mm -hmm. He asked me to chair a new ILA court uh, committee on the ICC. I didn't even know about the ICC. <laughs> and so I, I quickly Google all that, and I think that sounds fantastic. And I became probably the leading expert in the United States next to Sharif on the International Criminal Court in 1994, uh, thanks really to the invitation of President Rubin to chair that ILA committee. And then our committee followed the negotiations. We produced a draft statute. I was present at the UN during a lot of the negotiations met Ben Ferencz there, mm -hmm. and um, I'll never forget that, actually. I well, met, talk about it. Okay. Yeah, well, Ben was padding around the UN with his little briefcase and handing out flyers to some of his publications, and I met him, had his little cap on, and, uh, hi, I'm Ben Ferencz, here are my publications, nice to meet you, and we just started chatting. Uh, I wasn't anybody famous at all. And then I met John Washburn, mm -hmm. who was also there. John really took me under his wing and showed me sort of how, how to get in and out of all these UN negotiations and also what to look for. As states were beginning their commentaries, what was I listening for, um, what was important. So I really appreciated John doing that. Um, and then I went to Rome and saw the statute negotiated in Rome, so that was exciting. Beth was there also, excuse me, Ambassador Vencek uh, was there. She was talking about the experience, and I really kind of bore in on that a little bit. You know, here you were part of an, uh, representing a company, or a country, weren't you? Uh, no, I was an NGO and delegate. I was still an ILA okay. representative. Yeah. Okay. So you're there, but you're there, physically there. And uh, you're observer, mm -hmm. and uh, tell me about the deadline, the date. You were there, you're in the big room, and yeah. Beth was talking about looking at a screen which had all where the people were placed, you know, looking for the votes ultimately. And you really didn't know, I don't get, get the suspicion, of where the U.S. was going to end up. Oh, I, well, I had to leave before the final vote, okay. which is crushing. But my youngest was very, very young at the time, and I just wasn't comfortable sure. being away for so long. So I didn't get to see the vote, but I could have told you from the first couple of weeks where the United States really? was going to end up. Oh, yeah. I sat in the NGO room, uh, which was kind of aptly named the Sudan room, right? The NGOs were not in the nicest parts of the, 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 the FAO, La FAO, the Food and Agricultural Building. You know, Ambassador Sheffer would come in and he would brief us. And I still remember there was one day that a Senegalese member of one of the NGOs stood up and said, why should we give the United States anything? We know you are never gonna support this treaty. 
and you are never going to ratify this treaty. And David kind of tried to give an answer to that, but I think it was pretty clear where it was heading. Yeah. I think from my observation, because I was not a member of the U.S. delegation, I was an American liaising with lots of other Americans and lots of other NGOs, my sense was that the United States um, had its red lines from day one, never moved on those red lines, and those red lines simply were not acceptable to other states. And I think David and the other members of the delegation worked as hard as they could to try to convince states to change their mind, but I could have told them they're never gonna change their minds. It's just, really, this, is good, this, is, this conclusion, this outcome was foregone. And so when I went to Kampala many years later, I think the goal of the Americans like myself there who were not part of a delegation was to stave off the kind of anger and hardening of positions that we saw at Rome because you know, at Rome, the U.S. just got madder and madder and madder because states would not yield on those core ideas. Uh, there was not going to be a Security Council filter on all cases going to the court. There was going to be an independent prosecutor, and there was going to be jurisdiction over the nationals of non-states parties. And the U.S. dug in, other states dug in, and they kept turning up the volume, and it just you know, became a diplomatic shouting match, essentially. I mean, they didn't shout at each other, but it was a dialogue des sourds, as the French would say, a dialogue of the deaf. So at Kampala, it was, re and alas, that left the US delegation with very hard feelings, a lot of upset, a lot of distress, and then when they came back to Washington that summer, the, the readout of the meeting from that delegation was, oh, the anti-Americanism, the treaty's fatally flawed. We heard a lot of negativity, even from Ambassador Sheffer, which has been repeated by every anti-ICC person ever since. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a really unfortunate experience, I think. And then fast forward to Kampala. Uh, you were likewise a representative, but not really for the camera. That was yeah. de the definition of crime of aggression. Absolutely. So the Kampala, it wasn't just that. It was a stock-taking exercise. Yeah. But the, um, the big controversy was whether the crime of aggression would be finally included in the statute. There, there were um, a group of probably 80 countries at Kampala. I mean, they were close to not having a quorum, but they did. The non-state parties like the United States that had signed the final act of the conference in Rome could still go. They had very distinguished, you know, they had Harold Coe was there as our legal advisor, Stephen Rapp was there as our ambassador for, for war crimes, Beth was there advising um, Stephen. I think what was good about Kampala is especially Ambassador Rapp and Beth and others realized it was important not to harden the line so much that if you lost it became, you know, a, a crisis. Because, the, you know, in other words, they tried their hardest to get what the United States wanted, but without alienating other states or, or hardening positions to the point that had happened at Rome. And I think they were actually successful. I think they were successful they because they got a lot. Definition. Yes, there's a definition. At first, Harold Coe said he didn't like the definition. I think the U.S. has now walked that back and is now comfortable with the definition. Um, where the United States is still, that red line <laughs> is still there, which is they don't want any um, jurisdiction over acts of aggression without the consent of the state of nationality. And so that was a red line at Rome. The U.S. lost. It actually won that argument at Kampala, and I suspect is now regretting it deeply because of what's happening with right. Russia, Ukraine. Yeah. So maybe a Pyrrhic victory. Beth said the same thing. Uh, one of the NGOs, uh, or one of the people at uh, Rome was Whitney Harris. I know. And Henry King and Ben Ferenc, sort of an NGO a group of former prosecutors. Uh, did your paths cross with his at that point? No, you know what's interesting, Greg? I now say, I never understood why 
St. Louis. The dean was great. They made me the offer, but there were really good schools also bidding for me. And I now say I must have chosen Washington University because I knew I would meet Whitney Harris. I really do think it was kind of fate because I chose to start writing about crimes against humanity in the ICC, not even really being aware that there was this titan in the field living in my city. And then later that, and later in the 1990s, I can't remember when, uh, the law school invited Whitney to give a talk and a showing of his film, Tyranny on Trial. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to speak at that time, but I was like this little junior faculty member. I mean, I don't even think Whitney remembered me later. His wife, Jane, was still alive then. Mm -hmm. He hadn't yet um, lost her. And then subsequently, I got to know Whitney little by little as my work on the ICC itself became more well known and Whitney would be invited to, for example, our big conference on Nuremberg that the Harris Institute ran in mm -hmm. 2006. Um, which I didn't run. I wasn't the institute director, but it was a splendid event. I, you were the, I, yeah, I think you were there. Yeah. The Robert Jackson Center was very deeply involved in that. And uh, I got to know Whitney better and better over the years. But what an opportunity to know somebody like that. We had, uh, uh, really, it was my hour, just, uh, just for the tape purposes, Whitney Harris, uh, really one of the key Nuremberg prosecutors with, under the Robert Jackson staff. Uh, and we had an event in 2001. Mm. Yeah, we just started, and we thought we'd better do something special. We reached out to Henry, Whitney. Well, we had to write to Henry King first, and he immediately said, I'll come, but you don't have a conference unless you have Whitney Harris. Oh. I reached out to Bernie Meltzer, who was in Chicago, and he goes, I'll come, but you don't have an event unless you have Whitney Harris. Oh, gosh. And so with that, we clearly reached out, and they accepted, and he was a titan in the sense that we worked the heck out of them. I mean, interviews and speeches and presentations, and, and all three of those guys, I'm sure, were exhausted when the you know, three days was done. But yeah. that was the beginning of ours, our involvement. and With Whitney. With Whitney, yeah. yeah. And then he came. Every time he went out speaking, he, and he was in the area, he let us know we were there filming. I mean, we became kind of a documentarians, if you will, of all everything Whitney did. And, and then it was, uh, it was with Anna. So I, uh, 2001, Anna was there. So, uh, you know, many, many fond memories. And we have a couple of publications that we produced that he wrote. Uh, and the rest, we all know his history. And we come certainly to you guys and could have been more gracious hosts on there at Washington University. Oh, yeah. Washington. Yeah. You know, Whitney, and I'm so glad that you're doing this series because once people are gone, you can't replace yeah. these kinds of things. And there was a little video taken of Sharif at a conference where we all went to, to see Ben Ferenz. And I just play that video every time I, I can because it's, it's lovely to have those things. But Whitney was a brilliant, brilliant uh, lawyer. He was a great orator. He was a lovely person. Um, he had a tremendous, you know, he was a business lawyer too. Mm -hmm. He'd been general counsel for Southwestern Bell and he, uh, he really had both that acumen of where things needed to be done and how things needed to be done. He, he was amazing to be around actually. Plus, yeah. walked into a room, he was handsome as hell. Oh my gosh. He dominated every room. Yeah. And his voice, right? Yeah. The way his voice would, even at 97, yeah. his voice was amazing. Yeah, no, no, you're, yeah. And, uh, just a, a real legend, we both can smile and all of that. And I know at some point, uh, and I'd be curious, there's a Whitney R. Harris uh, in, Institute, and you were the first director. How did, first of all, how was it created and how did you get selected? Well, I actually am the third director. It was started at WashU by a colleague. Uh, Steve Lagomsky, who's now retired, and he started it, and it was called the Institute for Global Legal Studies. Mm -hmm. And so the institute was started in 2000 by Steve, and then Whitney endowed it. And so really it was Steve who brought Whitney into the work of the institute. Mm -hmm. It was renamed in Whitney's honor, and Whitney then became very involved in the work of the institute. Steve stepped down three years later maybe, and a fellow named John Haley uh, mm -hmm. took it over. 
John actually convened the Nuremberg Conference. Right. Well, he was yeah. a, Japan, uh, a J Japanese law expert, mostly focused on comparative law, but also loved the international criminal law. Um, and then I was chosen in 2007 to continue on uh, the institute. So I was there 14 years, which is a long time. And I'm now still affiliated. I still run my projects with the institute, but I don't have the day-to-day -day management, which is great. You have uh, are a world-renowned expert in a lot of areas. You've written incredibly well. You've got, I don't, know, I don't want to blow you up with a glory gun, but you deserve it. You know. You, but certainly the Crimes Against Humanity Initiative, talk about that because that's Leila Sadat. It's a big one. So um, I was asked to be institute director in 2007 and I didn't hesitate because I'd so admired the work of Steve and John and Whitney and it was a great opportunity for me. And that fall, I can't remember when I went to my dean, but Bosnia versus Serbia had been decided. and. Even though it was great that the International Court of Justice found this obligation to prevent genocide in the Genocide Convention, it was very frustrating to me that it, crimes against humanity couldn't have been alleged because virtually none of what happened in the former Yugoslavia was labeled by lawyers as a genocide. Mm -hmm. And so I just called up Richard Goldstone and Sharif Bassouni and I said, I think we need to write a Crimes Against Humanity Convention. Sharif had floated the idea in a 1994 article that mm -hmm. came out just as the Rome Statute was being negotiated. So then we dropped everything and turned to the ICC. But I had never forgotten that article. I read it when I was writing my very first pieces. And so they immediately said yes. And then I called Bill Chavis and Christine Manamingert and uh, Hans Carell and Juan Mendez. And together, the seven of us put together a steering committee and launched the project. We got a, a very, very generous donation from a private donor at my university, Cash Nickerson. Yeah. And Cash um, loved the idea. And so we started a whole series of meetings and roundtables, and Sharif started drafting. And by 2010, we actually had a, a, a draft treaty. Yeah, pretty exciting. So it's out there now, and kind of what is its status now? Well, we were very lucky because in 2010, when we were finalizing our draft, and I had had it translated into French. One of the things I'd learned at Rome is if you don't speak French, you're just gonna get hammered in international negotiations mm -hmm. because most states will negotiate informally in English, not the French. So everything we, was translated into French. They really want French documentation and French language negotiations. And so we had our draft and we launched it at the Brookings Institution in, um, I want to say March of 2010. I think it was March, yeah, because Whitney died in April. Mm -hmm. March of 2010, and Sean Murphy came to that conference and walked away. He, he came up to me and said, this is so cool. What a great idea. He then got elected to the International Law Commission and made working on the draft articles on crimes against humanity at the ILC his mission mm -hmm. at the ILC. Mm -hmm. 2019, fast forward from 2010 to 2019, the ILC finalizes its work and then it goes to states. And so it has for three years essentially been sitting in the General Assembly and this year we're hoping for a, a breakthrough, essentially. I could go into all the gory details about why we don't have a breakthrough already. Uh, Austria has offered to host a diplomatic conference. A couple of other countries have suggested they might be willing to do it but we need to get it out of the sixth committee, which is the legal committee of the General Assembly, into an ad hoc committee, and then a text prepared for negotiation by states. And you're still intimately involved. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I assume that would be. <laughs> oh, yes. As you reflect back, and I, I know we're, we're probably gonna run out of time here, Yeah. but um, are, are there certain things that you look at your, not only professional, your academic, your career, I mean, you have been a mainstay. And, and by the way, I should also point out, when we first had our International Humanitarian Law Then Dialogues uh, in 2007, you were here, Whitney was here. Yeah. And uh, uh, you were one of 
few females. There were only two. It was me and Betsy Anderson. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And so just as a reflection. I, I remember. Yeah. Well, it's a snapshot. But it was, it yeah. was, a, it was a, somewhat of a men's club. Somewhat was. And here we are today. If you took a photo oh, snapshot of the participants, the speakers, frankly, the interviewees who I've done today, uh, the majority are women. Can you, yeah. can you account for that? Well, one is just times have changed, right? I, I think that uh, it has been hard to break into the field. When I, so I went, my, my very first time I went to Syracuse in Italy where Sharif had his institute. I remember a colleague who shall remain nameless say to me, you know, what my wife says is the test of whether you're a good mother is whether you would go on the space shuttle. And I thought, there are women that go on the space shuttle. Like, this is terrible. And it was literally so hostile to women. Yeah. There, I was one of just a handful, and it was kind of active harassment. Now, I just think young women have looked at these um, areas and said, I want to do that. And there shouldn't be a barrier. And I think I'm still of the generation where the women who were my seniors often were women that chose not to have children, that dedicated themselves to their career 24-7, that mm -hmm. didn't feel like they could afford a work-life balance. And I think my generation, for the most part, we feel, come on, things have changed. We can have a family. We can be professionals. And so when we're mentoring younger women, I think for them, it's, it's a whole new world, really. And I notice that when things do happen, they're more likely to speak out than my generation. You, I never said anything if anybody was rude to me or I felt a little bit of hostility. I just kind of went up to my room, read a book, you know, <laughs> called home. I, I just, uh, I just would kind of swallow it because you didn't want to make waves. You wanted to be invited to the next meeting. Now I think people speak their minds, and I think it's much healthier for everybody. Sure. I think everybody has a lot more fun. It's a lot better atmosphere when you have men and women and people of all ages and creeds and ethnicities, right? We are talking about international justice. It shouldn't be owned by any one group. But it's really changed, yeah. Much, much more fun now. <laughs> well, and, and, well you, you've been a leader in many of those fronts, but as you harken back now on the one paragraph you'd put on a Wikipedia where it says Layla Sadat did this, uh, what, what would you put there? What are a couple of highlights? Oh, wow. Well, I'd probably put my three children first because I think um, being a mom to three kids is like, it just doesn't get better than that, even when they're driving you crazy. <laughs> That's probably your biggest achievement. And then just hoping that they launch into amazing human beings. The second really is having been had the opportunity to teach uh, unbelievable students and see them go into the world. And the third, of course, is the, the professional accomplishments that I've been really lucky enough to be able to do. The Crimes Against Humanity Initiative, my new project on gun violence and human mm -hmm. rights, mm -hmm. building up the Harris Institute. Uh, I'm super proud of my books that I've written, and hopefully the articles are being read by somebody somewhere. Um, I also think, Greg, it, there have been times during this period that it's been hard to be a U.S citizen and stand up for the Nuremberg principles. I know Ben talks about that, Whitney talked about that. Sometimes the U.S. is not on the right side and um, I've been really grateful to have a community to help me feel courageous enough to stand up when it's time to stand up. I was one of the leaders in the lawsuit against Trump when Trump mm -hmm. sanctioned the ICC prosecutor. And I'm really proud of standing up for the Nuremberg principles, actually, and um, maybe contributing a little bit to, to making sure they don't go away and get trodden on by my own government. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. So as you go off to, uh, as we wrap this up, what's the question you expected that I haven't given to you yet? Mm. Oh, you, you're a great interviewer. I don't know. Um, not really any, not really any question. Where, yeah. You know, you've been here 15 years. What, what's your sense of the, the benefit 
of the law dialogue slash roundtable? Well, I think it does go to the sense of community that you have all built. Everybody that comes is super smart. Everybody that comes works, is a highly respected professional doing important work, actually having to take time away from that important work to come here. So why do they do that? And I think they do it because the informal exchange of ideas is very helpful, actually. I always come away and I learn something. So that's like, wow, I didn't know about that, whatever the issue was. But the other is this coming together as a community to reinforce the values and the principles of, of Nuremberg. And that's not something that maybe we find in our everyday jobs. Mm -hmm. And so when we come here and feel so supported by the Chautauqua community, this beautiful setting on the lake, and we come together informally, you've been a big part of that. The Jackson Center has been a big part of that. David Crane is, is fantastic, and Jim at building that community. I think that's why we come back. It's a long trip and you're canceling classes or the ICC prosecutors, you know, doing a scooting out to take an urgent call. But yet we come because it's just really important to be together and, um, and, and, and kind of come together, not just for solidarity, but to learn, exchange views and go back refreshed. And that's kind of the Chautauqua idea. Yeah. I'm refreshed by being with you. Who is now refreshed. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Layla. Thank you, Greg. Thank you.